Let us pray. God of our lives, speak to us again through the scriptures, challenge us, and comfort us with the presence of your Holy Spirit so that we're assured of your love and inspired to follow in the ways of Christ, we pray. Amen. Our scripture today continues in Luke chapter 12. Listen for the word of the Lord. Jesus said, Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed for action and keep your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that they could open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves who find the master, whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat, and he will come and serve them. If he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But know this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Paul Lutter is a Lutheran minister, and he tells the story of how years ago there was a church that had gone through some really hard times, and they were considering calling him as their transitional pastor. So he's in the interview with the search team, and he makes some remark about how it seems to him that the church as a whole is feeling afraid right now, afraid of facing what they've been through, afraid of facing what's next. And he remembers that a man who was there named Bill stopped him and said, Pastor, don't tell us we're afraid. Then a woman named Rachel spoke up softly, who earlier had described herself as the most senior member of the congregation. She whispered, and Pastor, Don't tell us we need to change. And then Fred, a man whose foot was wrapped in a white plaster cast and propped up on a chair, slammed his hand on the table. Look, just promise us you're going to keep politics out of the pulpit. Then another member of the group, who wouldn't identify herself for some reason, rolled her eyes and said, And Pastor, please don't talk about healing. We've heard it all before, and we're no better off for it. In response, Slutter remembers he tried to say something pastoral, reminding them that even though they're afraid, Jesus still walks with them. The group really didn't like that idea, and they didn't end up calling him. From the way he remembers the story, it doesn't seem like these folks were very interested in the ways of Jesus, but at least they were honest about it. Because in his teaching, Jesus does call his followers to a way of life that's quite unusual. A way of life that when Jesus' first listeners began to understand what he was calling them to, their response was one of fear. This is a way of life, I dare say, is being more or less rejected by all of us in this room today, myself included. Leading into the text I just read, Jesus is talking about the importance of relying on God for daily sustenance and not storing up much of anything beyond what's needed for today, living the way that other creatures live. The birds of the air get their daily food, and they're getting along just fine. The lilies of the field are clothed in their natural splendor. How much more 
will God provide for your daily needs, Jesus promises. And yet when we consider letting go of all of our stored up resources and living on subsistence like birds and flowers do, that sounds a little scary. And Jesus knows this. So in the text I just read today, Jesus offers his brand of reassurance that really isn't all that reassuring. He says, don't be afraid. God wants to give you the kingdom. God wants to guide you into the divine realm. What does that look like? Sell your stuff. This isn't figurative. Sell your stuff and give away the proceeds as alms, such that the poor who already live on subsistence, who already live the ways of the kingdom of God, will have their daily bread, will have their material need met for one more day. This is how God wants us to live together in the world, Jesus says. Make purses for yourselves that will never wear out. This isn't a spiritual riddle. What kind of purses never wear out the kind you don't use, the kind with no money in them, the kind free from the wear and tear of hands in and out day after day? What kind of purses are safe from thieves and rot? Empty ones. For there's a world of pain out there, a world of competition, and production, and acquisition, a world of wealth to be grabbed at and hoarded, it's true. And a small percentage of people will find comfort and success in the melee, but it's at the expense of the majority of people who end up oppressed and indebted and lacking basic provision. For the rich to release themselves from their resources, Jesus thinks is a sacred liberation. For there's no place in the kingdom of God for a few folks to have much while others struggle. When Will Willimon served as dean of the chapel at Duke Divinity School, he tells the story that on the first Sunday of the school year, we had a group of students over to our home after the university chapel service. We had a picnic with them and then some lingered to play basketball or just to talk. I sat on our patio with one student. He said, Dr. Williman, thanks for having us over to your house. This is the first time I've ever been in a faculty home. That's a disgrace, I said. I think that we faculty ought to have students in our homes as often as possible. Well, said the student, I guess few faculty think that way and you have a beautiful home, let me ask you, do you feel guilty at all? <laughs> Being a Christian and living in a nice house? How do you justify that? And Williman writes, and I responded, now I'm remembering why it wasn't such a good idea to invite you people over to my house. <laughs> Friends, Jesus' teaching is scary, but it isn't hard to give away your things and your money. That's easy. People will gladly receive them from you, I promise. Jesus' teaching today is good news to him for the kind of shared life together that he has in mind, but overwhelming news to us who have much and who live according to systems of this world that, cause, that call us to store up and to cultivate comfort and to plan for a future and to give some away, certainly, maybe give significant amounts away, but always retaining more than enough for ourselves. Jesus says to his followers, defy these systems and their values of self-reliance. They're not what gives you life. Instead, he says, live as the poor do, for they possess the kingdom of heaven already. Let it all go, and then watch for God to provide you with daily bread. And he tells them this weird parable. 
that this world of production and acquisition is like an exclusive wedding feast. People are desperate for an invitation, parlaying all their status and social collateral to clamor through the door and fight for the largest share of the lavish feasts laid out on the banquet table. Meanwhile, Jesus sees himself as the wedding crasher, and his followers, his band, who break into the house while everyone else is distracted with the wedding going on outside. And at the end of the night, Jesus arrives in secret at the servant's entrance, arms full of the bounty from the feast. His followers let him in, and he serves them with these samples of the plenty. Food for today and a roof over their head for tonight. And these followers didn't have to do a thing to earn it except stay awake, to keep an eye out for the coming provision of God. What a way to live. And none of us are going to do it. Prove me wrong. But every one of us will leave this place today and continue to disobey Jesus' teaching on this point. We can be honest. I go to the gym, and I have a trainer, and my trainer can do all of the things. And what's very easy for him is very hard for me. But over time, some things that used to be hard are less hard than they used to be. I'll never be at my trainer's level, probably, or maybe one day, I'll surprise myself. Either way, I'll be closer to it than when I started. And in a similar way, I think this teaching issues a challenge to all who would draw near by faith, to all of us who will not obey this teaching in fullness today and yet find our hearts compelled to take one step in its direction. What will we do? What step of imperfect obedience will we take? How does our faith in God's provision and our desire to walk toward the ways of Jesus guide our ethic regarding what we keep and what we give away? Live as the poor do, Jesus says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In 1998, Barbara Ehrenreich set out as an undercover journalist to enter into and document the experiences of the working poor in the U.S. Over the course of two years, she worked for a month at a time as a server in Florida, a cleaner in Maine, a retail worker in Minnesota. Here were the parameters of her project. She would move to a new town and apply for the best job she could get without revealing her education or experience. She would find short-term housing that was available within the price point that her new job afforded her and try to make ends meet for just one month on her wages paid out weekly. Not surprisingly, she found that month-to-month -month housing is hard to come by especially without a rental history or a security deposit. She ended up paying double the average rent in extended stay motels week to week. Her rooms lacked appliances and refrigeration, which limited the food that she could afford to less healthy, processed corporate brands. She experienced the rigors of long, unpredictable hours, hard physical labor, clueless supervisors and cruel customers. And she forged relationships with people living this reality that for her would become the substance of a New York Times bestseller. When at the end of each month she would reveal herself and give notice at her job, she thought maybe her coworkers would be shocked or have lots of questions or want closure. But mostly they asked something like, so you can't take my shift next Friday? <laughs> In her final assessment at the project's completion, she challenges our notions of charity and philanthropy. 
The assumption that it's always the people who have more who are called on to give and always the people who have less who are, are receiving. Instead, she asserts, when someone works for less pay than she can live on, she has made a great sacrifice for you. The working poor are, in fact, the major philanthropists of our society. They neglect their own children so that the children of others will be cared for. They live in substandard housing so that other homes will be shiny and perfect. They endure privation so that inflation will be low and stock prices will be high. To be a member of the working poor is to be an anonymous donor, a nameless benefactor to everyone. And this, I think, gets to the heart of Jesus' vision for our shared life in the world. It's always characterized by this posture of lavish self-giving. Someone's always giving themselves away. But with the system Jesus has in mind, he doesn't want this self-giving to be taken by force from a system that demands it, but freely offered as part of the relational way of life that God intends. And it needs to go in all directions, God holding back nothing in providing for our needs, and we holding back nothing from one another. Sharing what we have such that no one has too much and no one has too little. Such that no one is forced to give beyond their ability while others keep beyond their need. Jesus offers this remedy, sell what you have and give the money away. That makes me scared, though. But Jesus says, don't be afraid, for the divine realm is already here. Clean air, sparkling waters, sunshine, arable land that produces fruit and crops, a human culture that has mined and cultivated and stored up the earth's resources to a major fault. We have what we need. We can let go of hoarding and fighting for resources at this wedding feast. Instead, we can have faith. The good news for the poor is that the spoils of the world's systems are heading their way already. You need only find yourself among them, Jesus says, and stay awake to receive God's good gifts with gratitude and then to share them with one another. Bread for today, a roof over your head for tonight, a community to set out with tomorrow morning to do it all again. What more do we need? Amen.